Welcome to the Voice for Mount Pleasant podcast, featuring discussions and interviews about the people, places, and events that make Mount Pleasant such a special place. Hello, this is Roger Gaither, your host for the Voice for Mount Pleasant podcast. In today's podcast, the publisher of Mount Pleasant Magazine, Bill Mascio, chats with Nancy Mace, candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives to represent South Carolina District 1. And now, here's Bill and Nancy. I'm excited here on Voice for Mount Pleasant because we have our special guest today, Nancy Mace. Nancy, I know you got to be busy. Thank you so much for joining us, okay? Of course, and thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. I am excited about this election year. Um, it's a very important election, and I'm just um, so grateful that folks throughout the community and throughout Mount Pleasant um, want to hear about what options and choices they have this November. I totally enjoyed my first, um, if you would, exposure to you was listening to you talk at the Charleston Medical uh, Association, the County Association. It was, it was really good. That dialogue you guys had about medical care would be uh, totally different now, would it not? No, 100%. And COVID-19 really has turned everything upside down, not just economically, but our health care too. And one of the things that we, we figured out early on with COVID-19 is that uh, American policy or our government uh, and the over regulations that we have, the burden of regulations within the healthcare system has really hindered um, our ability to respond faster, better, more in the case of COVID-19. And I know our, our nation has, you know, done millions of tests more than any other country in the world, but Um, But still, we could be doing more. We could be doing rapid testing, widespread rapid testing for folks. And so um, those regulations have hindered, you know, our ability to to do better and faster. And we even see at the state level when COVID-19 hit early on, the governor, uh, and I'm so thankful that he did, but he lifted the certificate of need regulations, which limit the number of acute beds a hospital can have. It, it limits the number of beds a nursing home or assisted living facility can have. And, and when you're going through something like this, those regulations should not be on the books. And so I've been pushing for a long time for um, regulations to be lifted in the healthcare space. And that's why you were at, the, that's why you were at the child. Why I was at, Cause I'm yeah. leading the mm-hmm. repeal of certificate of need at the state level. But the other thing we learned during COVID-19, which affects our healthcare and more importantly, our supply chain as well is that, you know, 85% of our active ingredients of pharmaceuticals are made in China. And, yes. you know, that that is a threat to our nation. And so we have got to, and the reason those things are made in China is not because the labor is so cheap over there. It's because the cost of regulations in this country makes it cost prohibitive to make, make those products here. And so we've got to do better for every regulation we create. We should be rolling back too. I want the people to get to know you, if you don't mind. Yeah. Tell me about your kids. Tell me how old they are. And yeah. and to me, what I wanted to know is in those moments like that you're unexpected, you know how as a parent that they our kids say things in most unexpected times. Yeah. Tell me what the kids, tell me a little bit about your kids and then also tell me what, what maybe some of those comments they made about mom. Yeah, well, my I have two children. I'm a single mom. I'm a single working mom. Uh, and my oldest is 13. I have a, both a son and a daughter. And my daughter is 11. Uh, my son is headed into eighth grade and really could care less about politics. I mean, he cares about Fortnite and whether or not he's going to get to go back to school and see his friends. Um, that's really all he cares about right now. Um, and then my daughter, Ellie, who's 11, she's a political junkie, like many wow. of us in the community. And she'll sometimes, like this summer, she spent time in the campaign office stuffing envelopes, licking stamps, writing thank you notes in cursive because she knows how to write cursive. Um, and, and, she, and Nancy, this isn't something you ask her to do. This is something she no, wanted to do. Oh, my right? gosh. No, I, I don't put it on them. I mean, occasionally I have to drag them out, you know, on my volition, not theirs. But it's something that she really loves to do. She loves to work. And she mm-hmm. loves to go knock on doors with me and – you know, campaign. And so, you know, That's even great. when we had events pre COVID, she'd show up with her little iPhone and start recording. I mean, it was just like the funniest. I was like, are you tracking me? Like what's going on here? And, uh, you know, she really gets into it because she's still young enough that it's interesting to her. If she were in seventh or eighth grade, she probably could care less, but they're very supportive. It may, Nancy, it may be her passion. You don't yeah, know. Maybe. No? I mean, maybe I'll be running her campaign one day, which would be exciting there you go. too. 
But um, no, they're both really good kids and they're very supportive and they understand how hard I work and they know why I'm doing this. Like they so you, know. So you, so you, so you're formulating in their mind a good work, work ethic, good work ethic, a hard work ethic. And, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life and my life has been a series of second chances. And so any opportunity I have to show them what leadership looks like, what helping our community looks like, what hard work looks like, because you don't have to be the smartest person in the room, but you do have to be the hardest working. Uh, in order to be successful in anything that so those are the values that I'm trying to teach my kids, you know, and I'm, I'm raising them in the same place that I was raised because I grew up here. I live on Daniel Island now, but I grew up in Goose Creek. And um, when I dropped out of high school, I dropped out when I was 17 and I had no intentions of going back. And my dad at the time, uh, you know, he's a retired general. My mom was a school teacher at my school and they said, if you're going to live under our roof, you live under our rules. And the rule was that I had to work. And one of my first jobs was at the local Waffle House on exit 203 on College Park Road in Ladson. Yeah. So everybody, I'm sure, asks you about the Citadel and all the yeah. other achievements you've had. I yeah. want to know, yeah. uh, what, did, what was your takeaway from the Waffle House experience and how long did you work there? I don't remember the length of time. If it was a couple of months or several months, I don't remember um, the exact time frame that I worked there, but I learned I learned a lot of valuable lessons at a very critical point in my life. A very I would say um, um, vulnerable time in my life, and one was work. How to work because the people, the folks that work at Waffle House work very very hard, and they have a very strong work ethic. And the employees get compensated well. If you work hard, you're going to make good tips and good money and be rewarded by corporate uh, for that work. But I also, one of the cool things about Waffle House is everyone has a Waffle House story. So everybody right. gets Waffle House at some point in their lifetime. And you would just meet the, just the neatest people. And, and a lot of them were blue collar, hardworking, getting off the night shift or getting off their, their shift after being at the police station and working. I mean, listening to America, really the heartbeat of America, those people that are working those long shifts and they just want a cup of coffee when they get off and listening to their stories and the kind of work that they do and then meeting their wives when they come in to join them when they got off their shift and just meeting people in the community. What's your takeaway from your relationship with your mom? My mom was a teacher, so yeah. I can relate to that. So, so what, what, was, what did she contribute to who you are today? My mom is super smart, and she works hard like my dad. Um, I kind of have an, uh, the attitude of my father, but the, like the, the brain of my mother sometimes. I'm kind of like I'm one of each of them, but she's very astute, and I can have debates with her on any subject, and she just knows so much. And she's also my best friend who has. Oh, really, that's wonderful. Yeah, she's been through some tough times with me, especially growing up when I had certain setbacks and challenges. She was always there, even though I was sometimes making the wrong decision. She was there to make sure I came back and could learn from that decision or learn from that mistake and move forward with my life. And um, she's always had a great you know, love for me and wanted to make sure that I had what I needed to be successful. I mean, she's a remarkable human being. I think through our challenges, we gain strength. So I commend you for recognizing that. I mean, yeah. a lot of people don't like to say they've had difficult times or challenges, but that's yeah. what makes us who we are. I asked you early on if you had a dog and I know you don't have a dog, but tell us about your cats. Yeah, I have two cats. Um, uh, so a couple of years ago, I, I took both children to the SPCA to adopt two cats and they each got to pick out one and nice. um, my son who's cool calm and collected picked out a cat and named him Tyler and he's just the quietest calmest kitty and doesn't make it out in public very often <laughs> um, but then Tiger is our wild cat he likes to go he's our indoor outdoor cat and he's definitely his personality is reflective of my my second, my youngest child, who's a lot like me. She's hell on wheels. And uh, so is that cat. And so Tiger was just sitting on my lap, but he, uh, he likes to bring mice home. And I guess he's trying to teach me how to hunt. I'm not really sure why he does that, but he does it too often. <laughs> we would talk briefly how hard campaigning is. Uh -huh. So I believe people reach their, their greatest heights because of their passion. 
what, what is, I'm not talking about issues, okay? I'm talking about uh-huh. you internally. What, pa- what, what is yeah. inside you that makes you want to go through all this? I love what I'm doing. Like, I love what I'm doing at the State House. And in fact, um, I got a call from a very dear friend of mine about two weeks before I announced my run for Congress to do this. And they're like, I finally have figured you out. And, and they said, this gives you purpose, what you're doing right now. It gives you purpose. It gives you drive. And they said, you know what? You're very good at it. And I am so passionate about my community. I grew up here. I'm from here. I'm raising my kids here. I work here. I love everything I'm doing in the state house, and I want to do more for more people. And it's not just about the legislation. That's only the half of it. It's not just about the policy. That's only part of it. But it's really about your constituents and what you can do for them. And for example, that could be everything from, like I got a call a week ago from a grandmother taking care of a special needs child and their trash wasn't getting picked up and diapers were piling up and she needed a second trash can. And I worked with the county to get her a second trash can within 24 hours and it just had so much meaning that I could just pick up the phone and be helpful. But um, one of the greatest things I've done, and this is bigger than I think any legislative accomplishment I've ever had, but I had a mom called me, and this stuff happens all the time, but you just don't realize it as a state lawmaker, everything that you do. But I had a mom call me uh, last summer, and I don't even know, she's a constituent I know now, but I didn't know it at the time that she was. But her adult daughter um, does not live in my district, and her adult daughter was diagnosed with breast cancer. It was a lateral breast cancer, meaning on one side. And it was an aggressive, very aggressive form of breast cancer. Her oncology team, surgical team, everybody said she needed to have a double mastectomy, a bilateral procedure to have both breasts removed because otherwise she had an 80% chance of the aggressive breast cancer returning. But the insurance provider wasn't going to cover the procedure because she hadn't had a genetic test, the BRCA test previous to her cancer diagnosis. Now I'm a woman, I'm 42 years old, I wouldn't know, I don't know anything really about the BRCA test. I don't know where you get it. I don't know how much it costs. Don't even know if insurance would even cover it. Um, But I said, and the mom was so frantic and upset. And I said, I can't make any promises, but let me make a phone call. Called the insurance company because I knew a guy that was there. And three hours later, he called me back and said the medical team re-reviewed the file. And they were going to cover her procedure 100 and that's an awesome story. That, I mean, that, awesome kind story. Of, that just gives me chills that I had that kind of an impact on somebody's life that I literally took a phone call, made a phone call, and I helped solve a problem that was so personal and so deeply personal to this family. I tapped into your passion, but yeah. one of the things every September, October edition of Mount Pleasant Magazine, mm-hmm. I love writing and interviewing women that have gone through the process yeah. and have conquered, uh, you know, cancer, the big C word, yep. because their stories are unbelievable. And, yeah. and you can't, you can't even write stories like that, you know, yeah. fiction wise. It's just, they're just yeah. awesome, you know? Yeah. So that's a great, that's a great testimonial, Nancy. Very yep. good. And that, sh- and that definitely drives your purpose, doesn't it? It does. It gives me enormous purpose. And it's why I do what I do today. It's why I'm so passionate. And it's why I work so hard because I want to look out for the community, those in my community, as much as I look out for my children. And I feel like right now, I never would have said this six months ago. I wouldn't have said this a year ago or five years ago. But, you know, this, this, this year, I mean, this election really is going to determine our future for our children and our grandchildren. And it's just really important that People pay attention and figure out, you know, what direction they really want to take. Well, Nancy, no matter what side of the fence uh, the the people are on, I know that people are frustrated because the two-party system, they're not talking enough to one another. Will you... Or are you capable of going to the other the other side and communicating? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, and that's I think really important for me to tell that story right now because. Um, I'm a fiscal conservative, and anytime my own party has wanted to spend too much money, I've said not a dime more. Uh, it's really important, but I've also I have stood up against my own party. I'm known for that. I've made headlines doing that, especially when it means putting the needs of people in the low country 
first. And I've done things even that Democrats only talk about doing. As a Republican, I passed a prison reform bill, totally 100% bipartisan, not a single Democrat or Republican voted against my bill as it came out of the House onto the governor's desk to be signed into law three months ago. Um, I've done that prison reform. And so I've reached across the aisle. I have effectively passed legislation, my own bill, not not a bill that I say is mine, but it actually was mine, um, that I've worked on and done in, a, in such a bipartisan manner that it's rare to see. And I believe truly that, you know, the state level and the federal level is totally different, but we need really people with that mindset that when they go to D.C., they're going to represent our interests, not theirs, and not theirs of their party leadership, but ours of the low country, because the low country has always had this super independent streak. And I believe that my body of work in the General Assembly is reflective of, of those issues. Uh, Nancy, are- do, you, do you think people change when they get to D.C.? I think anytime anybody gets elected that they change. Um, something sort of happens And it's almost like I see a lot of folks that when they do get elected, it's almost like a deer in headlights and they can't say no to their leadership. And it's something that I've been consistently good at saying no. I really believe in being honest with people, even when you disagree. And even when leadership has wanted me to vote for something and I've had to vote against it because it wasn't in the best interest of my district, um, I've always been very open to explain to people why I'm not with you. And they appreciate that honesty more than anything. And that's how somebody like me has been able to navigate the system and and grow. I sit on judiciary in the State House of Representatives. It's one of the, the best, highest, best committees you can be on because 75% of the bills that go through to get a vote on the floor of the House go through judiciary. And you don't get that by, you know, I got that by working hard and being honest with people. And I think that's just, that is something that is missing in politics today because you have these folks that run for office and they say one thing, whether that's in DC or Columbia, and then they come home and they say something else. They're doing one thing and then saying something else. And it's very, it's very disingenuous. So even if we disagree, you're always going to know where I am on an issue and you'll know why, um, because I just believe that honesty is important. I believe bipartisanship is important. There's so much gridlock. There's so much division. People are literally trying to tear our country apart right now and we need to bring people together and unite. Absolutely. Them. Bring the people together is really 100%. important. 100%. As I said earlier in the podcast, you know, Mount Pleasant Magazine is a community magazine and his podcast is too. So I called a friend of mine up earlier today. Uh-huh. I said, hey, if you were having coffee or lunch with Nancy, what, what would you ask her? She said, ask Nancy, is she for off, offshore drilling? Because it's been reported by other people that yeah. you aren't. So, so can yeah. you elaborate on that a little bit? That's Are you for well. offshore drilling? No, I'm a totally against offshore drilling. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. You're never going to catch me in a catch-22 where I say one thing or flip-flop. I've been against offshore drilling since the very first time I was elected. The first bill I ever filed as a state lawmaker was against offshore drilling. The and what, what year was that? January of 2018. It was like my fifth day in office. And the first rally I ever spoke at was against offshore drilling. I even stood shoulder to shoulder with Congressman Cunningham on December 12th of 2018 at an anti-seismic testing event. And I was the only Republican from the General Assembly there. And I've always been against it. I have almost 100% rating with the conservation voters of South Carolina. And... um, what I despise the most in politics is dishonesty. And my opponent, Congressman Cunningham, knows that these negative TV ads are just not true. And he's standing there silently, not disavowing the lies that are being told about me. If somebody checked your records out, they could see very clearly. And to say that you mm-hmm. uh, were, were at a, were at a uh, offshore drilling uh, a thing about the seismic, and you're the only Republican there. That says a lot, I think, anyway. It says a ton about so, where, I stand, where, where I stand on it. And it's, I mean, they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars spreading this god awful lie. I mean, it is totally a lie. And if you look at my voting record, you'll see that. I think where they, I think where, where the rub is, is that Congressman Cunningham touted a bill that passed out of the House and pretended it was made into law. 
and wants people to believe that he banned offshore drilling off the coast of South Carolina when he did no such thing. Um, it was actually the state of South Carolina that has effectively banned offshore drilling. We do it every year via a provision in the budget, in the state's budget. Um, Congress How many years have they been doing that, Nancy? Oh, several years, three to five years at minimum. And Congressman Cunningham's bill was a federal mandate that would ne will never become law because there's no chance of passing out of the Senate. The president will never sign that bill into law. And I take issue with him calling something that's partisan and calling it bipartisan because his bill, not a single other member of South Carolina's delegation even voted for his bill. Like if it's going to be partisan, the least you could do is get members of your own delegation to actually vote for it and support it. And they didn't. And the other thing is, you know, I've been advocating for years, and this is something that Congressman Sanford advocated, was let, allowing states to have the right to say that they don't want drilling off their coast. Because if you can do that, if you give states the rights, if you inject some level of federalism into the, into the policy or into the discussion, you're going to get more Republicans on board than not. You're going to get a truly bipartisan bill that can pass both chambers of the House and be put on the president's desk to be signed into law. And I'm about, I'm not about making headlines and making people feel good. I actually want to do something. And if you can't look at this issue in a bipartisan way and truly see the benefit of allowing states to have the rights to, to say what happens off their shores, then you don't get the issue. You don't understand the issue. You're not truly in it 100% to get anything to pass. It's for you just a shiny object that the press can write nice things about. In the latest My Pleasant Magazine, we did an article on uh, the 19th Amendment. So August is Sovereignty Month, as you know. Yeah. What, tell me, what when you dig down inside your hearts of hearts, mm -hmm. how do you feel about that? I mean, can you imagine fighting for I that? I can't believe then? it's only been 100 years. I mean, really, yes. that women had the right to vote. And I'll be doing a women's suffrage march uh, next week, actually, um, in celebration of this. It's kind of crazy to me that it's only been 100 years that we've had the right to vote. But I also look at how far we've come as a country and that as a woman, you literally can do just about anything um, if you put your mind to it and you just work hard to get there. And the other thing that is so, um, I think, mind-blowing for me as a woman is that South Carolina has never elected a Republican woman to Congress, ever. And we now have a real opportunity. We have a female candidate who has worked on these issues, whether it's jobs, the economy, uh, business development, healthcare, infrastructure, offshore drilling. We have a qualified female candidate who happens to be fiscally conservative. Um, and we have a real chance of doing that and making history this year, a hundred years after women had the right to vote. And I've been breaking barriers my entire life. And this is one that I would be honored. It'd be the honor of a lifetime to break this ceiling and do it here in Charleston in Mount Pleasant. You're a great contributor to the, to where we live. And I think our lives would be better if we had more people like you. Will this morning sent me if elected, Okay, would you help get federal funding for the uh, for the low country for the flooding challenges it has? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, I mean, if it if it even looks like it might sprinkle, we have flooding issues, and the same goes for beach renourishment and everything else, infrastructure issue wise. Um, you know, I my goal when I get to Congress would be the committee that I would ask for would be. TNI transportation and infrastructure so that I can help find funding um, for those issues here in the low country because we have such great needs and our needs are are more expensive in this area of the state than others because we live on the marsh we live on salt water and beaches and um, it costs more money for all of these issues and living on the water um, all of that plays into the flooding woes that we have and they're, they are enormous. And that's going to take someone who can understand that it's federal, state and local money that needs to work together in order to ensure we can make those improvements over the next decade or two, because those things are going to take a long time and they're going to cost a significant amount of money. The first thing I thought about was the, the, all the funding that's been dished out and doled out because of COVID. That's yeah. going to make our budget to do things like this even, even harder to get, is it not? Even harder, which is why we need to send someone to Congress who's willing to make cuts in spending. 
and vote against bloated budgets and vote to balance the budget. Because if you look at the trillions of dollars that the federal government is going to spend this year alone, um, we can't afford to do this going forward. And we've got to make some serious decisions on how we spend our money. Uh, would you rather have $52 billion spent in Afghanistan in an endless war every year? Or would you rather have that money back here at home helping us rebuild our infrastructure and doing the development that's needed to create jobs in this country? And so I think those kinds of decisions are ones that are worth discussing and having a debate about uh, philosophically and how we move forward. But we can't do it with a yes man. You've got to have someone who's willing to vote against their leadership and make sure that they do what's right for the low country. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. I've got to tell you, I appreciate you spending time. Extend an apology to your cats because I know it took away from their, their time. <laughs> I <laughs> no, know, but seriously, Nancy, it was, I really wanted people to get to know you. And I yeah. think we did that here. And, yeah, uh, and thanks for taking the exactly. questions from, from my friends and, and Will Haney yeah. and stuff. That was great. That was very nice. I appreciate you letting me set the record straight, too, because, um, you know, it's really it's very disappointing to see uh, Congressman Cunningham allow those kinds of negative and deceitful attacks happen. And it's just not it's not a good reflection of the low country. It's not who we are as a people. So. Well, good luck to you and um, yes, and uh, appreciate your time. OK, Nancy. Thank you so much. And you have a great morning. Thanks for spending your time with the Voice for Mount Pleasant podcast by Mount Pleasant Magazine. Your community, your podcast. Listen to past episodes at voice4mp.com.